Hey everybody, hey, Abraham here and Kai. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Government Contracting. And this week here, we're going to be talking about a $125 million fraud case. And, and the perpetrator is sentenced to 10 years in jail. We're also going to talk about the small business size standard and how that can impact your business competing in the government marketplace. And the third thing we're going to talk about is the government contracting industry has a new publicly traded index specifically for government contractors. Stay tuned. We'll see you on the inside. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Government Contracting. This is the GovGenie podcast about government contracting. And so this week here, Kai and myself, we're glad to be here. And it is the holiday season. And so what are you doing for your holiday? I don't know what, you know, I've done all my holiday shopping, so I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot to do outside of eat and sleep and rest. Kai, what are you going to be doing for this holiday here? Oh, man, I just uh, realized that um, Christmas is next weekend, so um, I got a little catching up to do, to be honest. But I'm glad uh, that you got yours done. <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I took the easy way out. So I brought I brought my my kids, my wife together, and I say, hey, this year, Santa is here right now, and here's some money for you, some money for you, and some money for you. And then I was done. <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm, uh, I got a little bit more, um, you know, it's my fiance, I got family, I got her family. Yeah, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. Hopefully, she took care of her family and got a gift from the both of us. Um, and I'm going to have to figure out what I'm going to do for her. We talked about what we're going to do together. We, Since the wedding is coming up very soon, we, we basically said we're not going to do any big gifts, but we're going to do a, a joint gift to each other. Uh, so we're going to we, we plan on purchasing a Peloton for the house. So that's, that's, okay. the, um, that's the plan. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that will be the, the gift of health and wellness. That's that's a great gift there. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. She loves cycle and I can, you know, I'm, I'm cool with any, any type of exercise. So not having to get up every time to go to the gym to try to work out. So hopefully we having a Peloton in the house, you know, it'd be a little more consistent. But that's, that's you know, that's a goal at least. Well, on that note, you know, I am giving myself uh, the gift of health and wellness also. And, you know, last week we went and climbed uh, Mount Yona. Woo! That was serious. Yes. And it was a was consistent, a steep, steep climb. I did look, Kai. It was uh, 1,133 uh, elevation. Okay. So okay. your phone, so your, was, your watch was saying 1,200 or 1,300, but that was off. That was a little off. But I mean, hey, you know, I, I thought it was completely off, like not even close. So it was in a ballpark. Yeah. And, and I feel, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I didn't think I was going to get sore, but man, I'm feeling it because, uh, you know, the review said not for beginners. And yeah, you know, I'm a beginner hiker. And so <laughs> I think we chose the wrong mountain to climb because, you know, I, I am paying for it. But what I did to do was this here. I decided that I'm going to go buy um, the, health and wellness investment in myself. So guess what I did? I went and bought the most expensive Nike shoes, the shoe that won the marathon, the Nike Alpha Fly. And I found one on StockX. For some of you who trade shoes, your, your sneaker heads, I found one on StockX for about um, 40 $50 lower than the market rate. So I bought that for $220 because typically they're about $180. Uh, and then guess what? I found another pair on Poshmark for $125. So I, I, felt, I felt suckered in and I had to buy the second pair for $125. Uh, but man, I tried those on and I feel like it, it's not here yet, but I tried it on at the store. They didn't have my size. So I had to go look online for it. But I felt like I was a gazelle. Kai, I was like running on air. It, it felt so good. Yeah, I mean, it's it seems good until you start. Uh, you get to mile about 15, 18, then you'll realize, um, yeah, the Mikey's are just, uh, I don't know, they're, they're not I cutting it. I, I don't have the Alpha Fly, I couldn't bring myself to pay $300 for sneakers I'm going to run in. 
Um, I'm a sneakerhead. I love Jordans. I have a whole collection of Jordans that I, I've spent, you know, hundreds of dollars on. But I don't run in those, and I don't wear them often either. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hey, if, if, you, on stickers and stuff. if you can afford Peloton, man, you can afford a pair of Alpha oh. Fly or Vapor Fly, man. Hey. We qualify this Peloton. We are looking at Facebook Marketplace, and our budget is six hundred bucks. Uh, so we won't be buying that brand new Peloton. I just nah, I can't bring myself to do that either. So <laughs> I might be a little cheap when it comes to those things. Yeah. Well, hey, health and wellness is worth investing in. So, but all of you who's watching this episode, you're investing in your business in the government contracting market, right? As a small business, you're thinking, hey. 2023 is coming to an end and 2024 is here. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a few things. We're going to talk about some things that happened this week or that recently happened. And so that's why we call it This Week in Government Contracting, just recent activity in this industry. And then we're also going to talk about a little bit of a year year review of what we did on this on this uh, channel. Can you believe it? We've, we've been at this here uh, for, for about a year now. Uh, we didn't start at the beginning of last year, but we, we've we been at this for almost a year now. And so we're going to look at a year review. We've got about 20 episodes already in in terms of this week in government contracting. And this episode is ep- episode number 21. Can you believe that? I cannot believe it. If you had told me in the beginning of last or beginning of this year that we're going to be doing a podcast, I would have I wouldn't have believed you. So. Glad to be 21 episodes in and uh, all the content uh, we've created and people who uh, subscribe. Uh, we really appreciate uh, everyone who watches the, the show. And uh, just know that this is uh, just the beginning. Next year, we're going to take it to a whole nother level. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, that's good stuff. And uh, I heard a little rumor that you've become a little superstar now, kind of like a, 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 a trending influencer in the government market because you were at an event and people were like, oh, Kai, let me get your autograph. And multiple yeah. people came to you. So I've, I've actually geeked about that. Not quite autograph. <laughs> not not there yet. But uh, people did have been watching the show, which is uh, which is great. Uh, I, I'm excited about that. And, um, you know, they they were very complimentary of all the knowledge and gems that we've dropped on the on the show in these last 21 episodes or 20 episodes so let's just keep it going all right well hey on that note let's dive in today's content and so let's go ahead and get this show going here great you want me i guess i'll start off here the first uh first article or first uh uh topic is that this um, executive mosaic um, created the first ever GovCon index. And so this index is a com- um, is a collection of 30 um, publicly traded companies. Um, so companies think of like Lockheed, uh, Accenture, Boeing, um, uh, 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 Booz Allen, um, or companies part of this index and companies of that similar size. And really it's, just, it's, a, um, it's an index or kind of a barometer um, about the government space and um, you know, really trying to basically give investors and people who are um, interested in this space um, a kind of a, a barometer in terms of how companies are performing and, and the different trends that are happening, um, you know, uh, for government contracting businesses, which I think majority probably this is probably, you know, um, uh, the same in across a lot of different industries. But most of I know for, for the most part, a lot of government contractors are privately held companies and don't report or earnings. So it's kind of hard to tell, you know, generally what, um, where the industry is going in terms of, of profits and, and, um, and revenues and that, and that type of thing. But um, this is pretty interesting. So what, what are your thoughts? Well, you, you know, the, um, in the government marketplace, the top 100 government contractors, they win about 52, 55% of all the contracting dollars. And so they dominate this marketplace. And Lockheed Martin, they win about forty-five to fifty billion dollars every single year. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of glad that they're creating a index to track all these you know all these companies. Not all of them. Some of them are privately held company. All that you know, in terms of the top one hundred contractors, but many of them are publicly traded companies. So it's interesting that they're they're taking the thirty top uh, government contractors that are publicly traded and they're going to create an index. And I think it's going to create more exposure for this industry if people that's in the M&A, you know, the mergers and acquisition marketplace is going to give more 
uh, more transparency, more um, opportunities for people to invest in the space here. And as a small business, now you can actually say, hey, you know what? My goal is to be on the index. You know, my goal is to be on the GovCon index and uh, it gives people something to shoot for. So I, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. And to your point, I mean, I think we talked about this a little bit last week, but, you know, top 200 companies, you know, win two thirds of the you know total contracting dollars and the top 15 contractors actually win uh, a third of the contracting dollars. So by having the top 30 companies, you have a pretty good, um, you know, assessment of where or what the government market is doing. Um, so I totally agree with you on that. And. You know, I'm not exactly sure what the insights are going to be from, you know, uh, monitoring this group, because I think, yes, generally speaking, government, uh, this will give you insights into most of the contracting dollars, obviously, um, or at least a good third of the, of the contracting dollars. But, you know, all the other businesses that are not uh, accounted for in this index, um, you know, you, you really don't have a good insight into that part of the business. Um, in which you know we think about small businesses and, and the amount of people that they they employ um you know here in the united states um you know we are going to be missing out on that insight and you know as a small business owner and you know my chip on my shoulder i'm kind of like uh you know wait you're not really you're not really seeing what's ha really happening in the government space because so many small businesses are not accounted for it here but you know again this is and this is good for the industry like you said yeah well hey let's move on to the next topic and um, uh, so in this week, the FAA is developing an air traffic tool built for the space age. Now, I love this here because in a few generations ago, people were building cars and, and people were leaving horses going to cars. And then shortly after that, people were going from um, cars into airplanes and we were we were flying to places well in this new generation here our kids right they're going to be going to space and i love the fact that the faa is say hey you know what we've got blue origin we got spacex we've got pacific spaceport we got all these different uh that we're in the space age race now and they're creating tools and creating resources uh to go into space the challenge they're having with this is they don't have enough funding. So they're going to have to work on creating more appropriation. Uh, I think they're expected to launch some of these here, this kind of like air traffic system, right? Right now, every single airplane that's flying out there, someone knows exactly what they're at. And this is, this is a, you know, the SDI, you know, the space data integrator is going to be a powerful tool. So it's int intriguing to see what it's going to look like. Because uh, maybe, I don't know, our generation where you and I would just be flying space, but I'm pretty sure that our kids has been routine to where they're like, yeah, hey, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to the moon. Uh, you you want to come, <laughs> you wanna come on this trip with me? Uh, right now, I think uh, for the big, big time money people is, you know, and, and even if you have money, they're not going to let you go into space. But uh, they're paying about $250,000 to fly into the uh not truly space, but you know, into the into the atmosphere where they consider that as space. Uh, but in, intriguing. You, you, you want to go to space, Kai? What, what do you think? You, is this something you're interested in about? You know what? I mean, there's so many places here on Earth that I haven't seen yet. So me personally, I'm I'm gonna um, you know skew there at first and try to, and, and then maybe you know later on when they perfect the uh, space uh, situation, I, I might. Uh, dabble in there, but uh, I do think this is an interesting uh, article, interesting um, you know situation, and that they're trying to integrate you know data from these different companies that are that are having missions, and I'm sure the missions will you know increase in the number, um, and, and integrate that data into the existing um, air traffic control systems. So uh, I can only can imagine the, the complexity in um, in doing that since these uh, air traffic control systems are. Um, quite old and uh, a lot of the workforce that knows how to, you know, code in those, you know, in that technology are no longer in the workforce. Um, hopefully they'll be able to figure out how to, you know, integrate the data in, in an efficient way. But um, nonetheless, it's definitely an interesting project for sure. Yeah, I look at it from an opportunity perspective, right? So for some of you who are 
uh, if the FAA is part of your focus, and then there is the new agency, right, Space Force. So, so we've got you know the Navy, you got the Army, the Marines. Well, there's there's the new agency called Space Force. Uh, and so, if you're interested in FAA or Space Force, this is a new opportunity because most people are not focused on some of these agencies here. If you're in technology, if you have experience in terms of uh, working with uh, you know different um, air, air traffic control. Uh, resources and tools. And if you have different things like that, this is an opportunity because they need help right now. Anytime there's something new that's being developed, it's your chance to be in the forefront of some of these uh, these opportunities here. So I would look at it from that perspective. If you're a government contractor or you're new in the government market and you, you've you been successful in, in, the, you know, it's in the in different markets, this is your opportunity to get ahead so I would reach out to FAA. You know, we put the article link into the description area so that you can read more about it. Uh, if you need more help, reach out to us. You know, we'll be more than happy to you know to have further conversation with you about how to navigate the government marketplace itself. But I would definitely look at it as an opportunity. Absolutely, an opportunity. All right. So um, the next topic is that uh, you know. There are some government experts out there that are forecasting that we may have a shutdown in January. What? Um, another one? Yeah, another one. And un unfortunately, I thought that uh, we were past um, this, uh, this 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 situation since uh, November when we um, when they did vote on, I guess, something uh, some type. Maybe it was a, just a continual resolution they had back in January. But um, unfortunately, here we are, you know, faced with another, you know, showdown again between um, Republicans and Democrats and the House and Senate uh, to pass some type of bill. And, um, you know, this this has implications. And I, and I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, over the last few weeks, we've noticed a huge increase in the number of RFIs and RFPs that have come out. And this is for us personally, and I, I don't know, I don't have the data, I or at least I haven't looked at the data to, to, to validate this, but it seems like um, this is unusual. The, the number of RFPs and RFIs that have come out in the November, December timeframe, especially here at the end of December, usually first quarter is quiet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's almost feeling like there's just like this huge rush that's going on right now. But, you know, I don't know. Have you seen something similar? Yeah, you know, typically uh, because of different challenges and the, you know, government, you know, almost shut down multiple times and delayed and delayed, uh, you know, sometimes the funding may have been approved, but the money's not ye there yet. And so what if it was allocated to be, uh, to be spent by September 30th, it may have been pushed to, you know, the first quarter. And so I think maybe that's the, the reason of the more, more than normal contract opportunity during the first quarter because typically the first quarter is kind of like a quiet period uh contract officer on vacation you know program managers are on vacation they're gonna they're taking their time off to get ready for the new year and ramp back up so the with the increased number of opportunities i'm just thinking hey maybe the money got delayed and now is being used and maybe it may be even tied back to the potential shutdown right because if I'm a program manager and there's a potential shutdown and I have money now, I'm going to spend it now. I'm not going to wait until uh, January 1st, second quarter comes around. I'm going to try to spend my money now before uh, the the shutdown happens again. So those are my my thoughts around that. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Or I was thinking that maybe, you know, the because of the uncertainty that happened in the October and November time frame that you know, maybe they didn't release some of these RFIs and RFPs that they may have normally done. And now, you know, now that they got past in the November time frame or the, the continuing resolution that happened, they started to release all these different RFPs and RFIs. And unfortunately, here we are with another, you know, looming shutdown in, in January, which, you know, again, it disrupts the flow of, of business that um, the government would typically be, be under. And um, and thus it hurts also the government and the people because as contractors, especially small businesses, it's very difficult to respond to all these different um, RFPs in this short time frame. 
Um, and I'm sure it's difficult for the contracting officers to handle all of the, the responses and all of the uh, solicitations that they have to put out. So hopefully, you know, our, I mean, I'm sure that that's like the last thing that our politicians are probably thinking about. Um, but hopefully um, we get to some type of uh, normal flow so that, um, you know, contractors can can respond appropriately. Contracting officers can do what they need to do. Program officers can do what they need to do. Um, and we could just have a, you know, deliver just better, better overall outcomes to, to the American people. Yeah, well, there's definitely a dysfunction with with our Congress right now, right? You, you uh, the red gets gets more red, and then the the blue states gets more blue, uh, or not necessarily state, but in terms of the polarization of politics. And for you as a government contractor, we've said this here in the past: don't get stuck about red or blue. Don't get don't even think purple. As a government contractor, you should think green. Think green, which is about the contracting opportunities, right? That's really your thought process. Don't don't let politics, don't don't be a sheep and let propaganda move you one direction or the other. Your goal is as, as an entrepreneur is doesn't matter which which party, which politics, you know, how they play all the propaganda out there. Your your goal is how do I how do I set up my business? Which politician is going to help me as a government contractor? Everything else is just noise. Think green. Don't think red. Don't think blue. Don't think purple. Think green. So that's my suggestion to everybody as it relates to all this stuff here. You know, politicians can play their game, but you think green. Yes, I agree. Hopefully we will, you know, like I said, like, like you said, you know, regardless of Republican, Democrat, as from as a business owner, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it does affect us. I mean, I, I saw an article, I think it was in the Washington Post about this is like the lowest number of bills that they've that our Congress has passed. And, in in, you know, um, I forgot how long, but it was they, the graph that they showed. I mean, they showed tall graphs every year. And then mm-hmm. this year it was like this little, this little like I think it was like 15 bills total that they've done. That well, that might impact. be a good thing. I mean, you know, because more rules and more regulation doesn't necessarily mean it's good, right? Uh, no, I mean, they said it's the least productive Congress they've had in, in a long time. So uh, I don't know. I mean, yes, I guess <laughs> less reg- regulation to some degree, but ho- maybe it's, maybe they, some, some of these bills was to reduce regulation. Who knows? But I mean, at the end of the day, um, it doesn't seem like we're getting a lot done. And, um, you know, and the, right now we've been measuring it based on the number of bills that they've passed. Yeah, so, I, I don't necessarily think that as progress, right? So, so I have a proposition. We sh- we should pass a bill that for every new bill we pass, we have to remove another bill or remove two bills or remove two laws, more so not bills, but for every new law we pass, we have to go back and get rid of two laws. Because here's the thing: there there is a law for every single thing we do out there. And we're, we're overregulated and, you know, and sometimes r- rules and regulation, right? The one thing that uh, our founding fathers did right was that we are a nation of laws. And I, I grew up in a nation where there wasn't law. We, ha- we fled the country of Laos when the communists took over the country. The ruling part makes, makes, the, makes the rules, right? And, and, and they, the law is... Whoever has money, the law is whoever can bribe somebody else. The law is if the if the party says this, you have no you have no authority, you have no say in the process. So so I grew up in a, in a country where there's not a lot of rule of laws, uh, or the laws are very skewed. So so I'm grateful for a nation that is governed by rule of laws, but at the same time, you know. We have too many rules and too many laws, and sometimes I think we should have have it where for every new law we pass, we need to go and you know get rid of one or get rid of two that is either not relevant or is outdated. Okay, I mean, well, I guess that kind of leads us into the next uh, the next topic, right? <laughs> sure, sure, um, yo, because the next next topic talks about uh, people breaking the law, right? <laughs> So, so we actually there's there's another fraud case that happened this week here, and um, uh, the Damian Williams, you know, the United States Attorney uh, from New York, 
uh, found Mr. Sina Moyedi guilty. He owns a company called Montage Inc. A、uh, hundred twenty-five million dollar guilty、uh, fraud case, where he actually received contracts、uh, up to one hundred twenty-five million during the time of the case here, and where he also paid bribes to government insiders. So serious matter here. He was sentenced to ten years、uh, in jail. So crime does not pay. I guess that's the lesson here. Uh, and、uh, we we've been talking about fraud for the la- last few weeks, but again, I really did want to talk about fraud this week, Kai. But man, 125 million dollars、uh, stemming for over 25 years, we have to address it. So,、uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, so this guy、um, basically was perpetrating that his company was woman-owned and Hispanic-owned,、um, and you know, he. Obviously, wasn't、uh, woman-owned business. They they checked with the one with one of his banks, and basically he he said verbally that you know he was the owner of the company, and he's always been the owner, and that was you know an indication of of、um, you know the fraud that he that he was committing,、um, along with I'm sure of many other things. So yeah, I mean crime does not pay. Obviously, I mean there's not enough money in this world that will.、Um, Uh, convince me to to <laughs> want to go break the law、uh, and have to you know sit ten years in prison because、um, that just yeah there's just nothing that could so yeah crime does not pay totally agree. Well,、Hopefully、hey, if you hear a little bit, bit, yeah, if you hear a little bit of background noise, that's my neighbor doing doing the yard, and、uh, they're so graciously they actually come over to our yard and they're actually helping. <laughs> Uh, clear our yard too. So hey, you know, grateful for my neighbor helping clear our yard. But man, it is、uh, disturbing our webcast, our podcast a little bit. But、uh, but we'll continue. So if it, if you hear a little bit background noise, that's just my neighbor being friendly, coming help and blow the leaves in our yard. But I'm going to share my screen a little bit. I want to talk about、uh, this company in terms of the number of contracts that they won, and then we're going to dive in a little bit more about this company here and.、Um, And and further a conversation as it relates to this here. So the company is called Montage, and so what I did was I went to USA Spending, down under recipient I put the company name here, and then I did a search, and so they have won over the you know since 2008 because this database goes back to 2008. They won 30 30 contract itself. You kind of come in here. And you know, so these are the contracts that they won here. If we go to the year, and we put up the time frame here, it shows that you know they won twenty six million in two thousand eight, and then you know a few contracts here in between. Their best year was two thousand sixteen at forty nine million dollars,、uh, and then twenty twenty one. I assume that this is probably the time where the court cases started happening. They either was deallocated and contract was taken away from them about eleven million dollar worth of negative contract awards. And so we look at this here. We look at the total number of years, right? Collectively, you know, even after the lawsuit, they've they've they've、uh, garnered about one hundred thirty million dollars in contracts. But because of the misappropriation of、uh, or the the fraud and the the perpetration of bribing、uh, contracting officials, government officials. Uh, insiders to get them contracts,、uh, it, it's become a major obstacle for this company. So my guess is this company may not be in business、uh, after this year, or at least the C, the the founder、uh, will will you know have to deal with it、uh, from behind bars. So my point again is do things right.、Uh, there's shortcuts in the government market, but sometimes shortcuts may not always be. There is a difference between. Doing things that may be、uh, not necessarily—it's、uh, a gray area, right? So, for example, let me kind of explain to you what gray area is. Let's assume that a husband and wife owns the business together, and they decided they're going to、um, restructure their company so that it, they can go after a women-owned business designation. When that situation, you can sell the shares from the husband, make the wife fifty-one percent owner. 
and then make sure that the wife is the CEO. Make sure the wife is the highest decision maker. You restructure your operating agreement, restructure your bylaws, and and that makes it legal. That makes it compliant. There's nothing wrong with that. So so in that situation, you're you're sh making shift to make sure that it is a legal or organization to be properly in compliance with getting a WSB certification. Now, bribing someone, there's nothing great about that, right? Bribing someone is just either right or wrong in that situation. So don't take shortcuts, do things the right way, help your business to keep, uh, keep thriving, keep winning gummy contracts. So that's our encouragement for you. If you're listening to this episode this week here, uh, if you're tempted by shortcuts, don't do it. It will eventually catch up to you. Do it the right way and go out there and, and build a company that you can be proud of. All right. So last topic, um, the SBA is looking at uh, revising the uh, size standards methodology. Um, for, and this is the way that um, the SBA, you know, creates, and maybe you're probably a better person to kind of explain this. I kind of understand in theory and, 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 and out in the application as well, but maybe you can explain a little bit more about what, um, how the SBA determines the methodology or how it's used. Sure, sure. So, so every few years, uh, typically five years, uh, the SBA does a review of how they define what small business size standards are. And I remember all the way back in 2007, when I first got into the government marketplace itself, uh, size standard was very different back then, right? Back then, like a uh, construction company was like $21 million. They were considered a small business. Now, a construction company is like, 45 million dollars now uh and so yeah time does fly and inflation does impact in terms of this how they determine the size standard but size standard is de determined for contracting purposes and so if you are and what they're deciding is who is a small business and who is a large company they determine size standard based upon a few things they decide size standard based upon um revenue or number of employees Every industry has, you know, every NAICS code has its own size threshold amount. And so in your industry, Kai, uh, do you know your size standard for, you know, for IT software development, what your size standard is? Yes. 34 million. 34 million dollars. It used to be, you know, about 20 million dollars. And different areas of IT and it went to 25 million and went to uh, 27 million. Now it's $34 million. And so let me, I'm going to show the size chart uh, for us here. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the size standard based upon different industries and how this can be good or bad by increasing the size standard as the SBA makes these changes here. Now this is, they're taking uh, comments right now. So this is the time that if you feel that the by increasing or decreasing or the methodology that they're using to determine this error can impact your business, this is the time to uh, to give the SBA some feedback. And the the email is uh, in the description area. So go to the description area and, and reach out to the SBA, go to the website, make comments so that they can uh, make as they're making the size decision that they can be more favorable to, to your business or small businesses out there. So this is the size standard. Uh, I'm gonna go all the way to the beginning, right? So this is based upon, uh, this. the last revision was January, 2022. And so now it's being modified. And if we come in here, we can see that every next code has a size standard. Now, soybean farming, 2.25 million that's kind of really this is one of the lowest size in terms of a threshold here but let's get into more of the industry that most of you are in so we get into the construction right the 236 236 are the construction next code so we get to here like single family housing is 45 million we get into residential remodeler 45 million uh yeah i would say residential remodeler is different from a a uh the, the new construction housing co uh, uh, company, but it's the same size standard. And then we get into the highways and the, so we're talking about vertical construction and then we're talking about horizontal construction. 
So streets, bridges is 45 million. Um, and so dredging is 37 million. Uh, if you're in the concrete industry, you know, concrete foundation structure, that's $19 million. So this is a little bit lower. If you are a masonry or a roofer, there's $19 million in terms of your industry uh, size standard. If you're less than 19, you consider small business. Now, small business opens up doors for you for set asides and for sole source. Set asides has to do with every project that is in uh, that is less than uh, 19 million dollars in terms of of uh, scope, then it can be it, it goes into a small business. Small business can bid on those projects there. And so, so set aside is very important. Sole source is actually the most critical opportunities for you. The sole source threshold is four point five million dollars for civilian agencies, and then eight million dollars for DOD because the NDAA just uh, got approved a few weeks ago. And so now DOD, you can get a sole source contract for up to eight million dollars. And if your business falls under these size threshold, then you can get the set aside. You can get the sole source contract. So that's why this is important. And then let's go look at a few more industries and then uh, we, we can have a healthy conversation about what this means for your business, uh, you know, out there. So, so if we look at this here, you know, we can kind of come and let's look at some service industries. Let me get to the 5-4, um, 5 4 you know, some of these here. So if you are in administrative management, right? Five four one six one one twenty four point five million dollars considered small. If you're an HR, twenty nine million is considered small, and then uh, environmental consulting, nineteen million dollars is considered small. Yeah, but lots of uh, all this here will change. So with the new guideline, it's going to change. Let's look at a few different manufacturers instead, because I said earlier, right? It's determined by revenue or by number of employees. If you, if you sell aircraft parts, 1,500 employees. Now, if you have more than 20 employees, more than 50 employees, from my perspective, that's a large company. Uh, but they're defining that if you have 1,500 employees, you're still considered, uh, or 1,499, you're considered a small business. If your advertising agency, 25.5 million, all these numbers will, will go up even higher. Now, uh, what are your thoughts about these right? size standards? Uh, you know what? I actually don't disagree with the size standards. I mean, I think so. This is the way that the size standards has affected us as a business. We were going after um, or we were partnering with companies to go after um, projects that were like administrative services or uh, janitorial services that, that or services that included a lot of different things. And every one of these contracts has a specific NAICS code associated with it. And that specific NAICS code, you know, if it's a if it's a small business set aside, um, there's you know, you have to be with you have to be lower than the size standard that's indicated here. So if it, if it was a project that would fell under that five, four, one, five, one, one, um, you know, uh, NAICS code, then if you were the prime contractor would need to be less than thirty four million dollars in terms of your annual revenue. Um, and so there was a couple of times where we were going after stuff and we weren't able to, to go after it because the, our prime, uh, was larger than the size standard. So, um, when it comes to most of the things that we looked at, I think it actually kind of makes sense. Um, even when you look at those, man, um, uh, air, air, uh, airplane manufacturers and, and those types of things, those part manufacturers, 1500 employees, you got to think, right? These are these are um, factories or or manufacturers where there's a lot of employees that pay, that you know put together you know these types of, of of parts and stuff. So when you look at the number of employees, you know sometimes they're not necessarily you know a high uh, high skilled or a high paid um, employee. They may be actually a, a minimum wage or you know a type of type of employee that they that they have or part time or there might be a lot of different things that play into that. So, you know, from from my perspective, 1500 employees kind of makes sense. Right. Um, now, I think where where I would probably argue there needs to be a little bit more scrutiny is some of the other 
um, categories like the technology related um, NICS codes, where you have the way the SBA was looking at this is they're looking at data across all the different companies that offer these types of services. And so how much revenue that these companies produce, how many employees that they have, and they're making a cutoff like, hey, at this point, you know, this is where, you know, this the the threshold is where, you know, someone crosses into a large business. Um, when you have companies where like Lockheed Martin or uh, uh, Norfolk Grumman are 541511, you know, type of companies in that category. And then you have like companies like mine, there's a huge disparity in, in the revenue and the number of employees. So to put it at 34 million, I'm not saying that that's incorrect. I would just say that maybe there needs to be greater scrutiny in terms of categories where there's such a huge disparity between, you know, um, a small and large contractor. So maybe there's, you know, something else that can add into that calculation to make it more applicable. But generally speaking, I, I don't know if I disagree with 34 million being, in fact, I actually kind of think it might be, I don't know. I think, I think it's, I, I, I don't disagree with the, the size standard. Okay. Well, I, I feel that that hurts. If they increase the size standard, I think that hurts small businesses. So I'm going to pull up a revenue per employee for IT industry, right? And let's see what that equate to. So, so revenue for per, you know, revenue per employee for software company. So this is the IT industry, 160,000 per employee in terms of average right now. And now in, in the government market, it may be a little bit higher, but let's just assume we're going with the average here. I'm going to pull up my calculator. Uh, and then let's, let's see, let's see about how many million. employees, huh? 34, 34 million divided by 160,000 yep. 160, yep. is 212 employees. 212 employees. Kai, do you think about that there? As an IT company, you have about, you know, you don't have 215, uh, 212 employees. How do you compete against no. somebody that, that have 212? They have four or five proposal writers. They have, they have more capacity than a small IT company that have 10 employees or five employees. And so, so that's a big so argument, gap. So your argument should be less? My argument is the size threshold should be, you know, for like IT should be like $20 million or $15 million. A construction should be, you know, $15, 20000000 million because $45 million, let, let's do in revenue employee for construction, right? And, and there's a big difference between these here because it hurts the small business when these revenue, you know, shows up as relates to this. So construction is 150, right? So let's go with 150. So, so it's about 200 employees. So we go with construction is 45, or it's actually more because construction size is $45 million or, uh, or less is considered small. So we divide that by 150 in, uh, per employee. Oop, too many zeros. That's 300 employees for construction industry. I mean, most construction company, if you are a small business, you're, you got like two, three, four or five employees. You don't have 300 employees. When you're competing against a company that has 300 employees or more, their capacity is totally different from your small business where there's five of you or two of you or three of you. Some of you who's watching this episode, you're a solopreneur. You are wearing the hat of the CEO. You're wearing the hat of the janitor. You're wearing the hat of the proposal, right? You're wearing the hat of the capture manager. You're wearing every single hat. And Kai, you understand that. You wear every single, you know, you wear four, five, six different hats for your own company. And so I'm, I'm saying that when a company has 300 employees, that looks very different from a company that has five employees. Oh, totally, totally agree with that. But, you know, if you're over 300 employees and you're now, you're no longer small. So. But 299 is considered small. Yes, yes, <laughs> I get that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I I get that. I haven't really thought about it in depth enough to really to have a, a true opinion about it. But the size standard to me is hasn't been um, 
I don't think it's been that big of a deal, especially because there's always ways around it. And I think that's probably the bigger issue that I would probably have is that there's always a way around this whole size standard. There's always a way around a lot of these rules, which to, to me, this particular thing is just a piece of the, the overall puzzle that, you know, is it, that makes it difficult. But, you know, at the end of the day, that you know, there's, there's, a, there's a balance, right? The government has a, has a job to do. They have to pick contractors that are able to deliver services. And, and on the other side, they have to also, you know, be conscious and, 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 um, be, and help small businesses um, grow so that they can have more competition in the space. Um, so I would need to see more information, more analysis to have a true opinion about it. But the size center to me is not a true, not a big issue in my opinion. Well, I, I think it's, it's a, uh... Yeah, I think the SBA has bias in determining the size standard. And here's what I mean by that. I do have a strong opinion about it. And uh, my, my opinion is this here. Every year, the SBA, they have a budget, right? The government gives the SBA budget. So let's look at the SBA's budget. SBA annual budget. And so they receive $914 million dollars. That's 900, almost a billion dollars to help small businesses. And their goal is to help small businesses win contracts. So th they have failed at their goal every single year. And so the only way they can get closer to meeting their goals is by increasing the size standard. So they can say, oh, these are small businesses, but they're not. 300 employees is not a small business. 1,500 employees is not a small business. But they move the threshold higher so that they can say, well, this 1,499 company that has, you know, these employees here, they're a small business. And so we met our goal. They're, they're, they're skewing the numbers so that, because the st statistics, right, it's about manipulation of number. And so they're trying to make it look like they reached their small business goal. But the small business are the 10 employees, the 15 employees, the 30 employees, the 40 employees. Small business is not 15, 14.99. Small business is not 300 employees. And so my personal opinion is that the numbers are being manipulated so that they can look better in the eyes of Congress. So the SBA doesn't get slapped by not meeting the small business set aside goals, not meeting the, you know, all these, all these goals that's been put. They received $914 million to help small businesses, whether it's with, with funding, uh, loans, whether it is with bonding for small business, but contracting also the all of these small business set aside programs, the 8A program, the women certification, the veteran certification, the, the hub zone, all these programs are under the purview of the SBA. And when they fail at meeting the goals, they increase the size threshold so that they can look better. So that's my own personal opinion. I love the SBA, but I also have a love-hate relationship with the SBA because I feel like sometimes they don't do their job well. And so if you are tied to the SBA, yes, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you do a better job in helping the small businesses. Now, I will say there's a few things that I've seen previously uh, about the SBA. Some of the old SBA BOS, Business Opportunity Specialized, I've known some really, really bad BOS to where they made some serious mistake and the SBA covers it up. And uh, But what I have seen more recently in the last year, year and a half, is some of the BOS are gone. And the new BOS that are coming in, they have a better perspective. They have a better attitude about really helping small businesses. So I will say those are some positive things I see with the, S the, with the SBA is some of the new BOS they actually respond to your emails when as an 8 company, as a women-owned business, when you engage SBA, they're actually re more responsive. When you send a, make a phone call, they actually return your phone calls. But previously BOS, and there are still some bad BOS out there. And yes, I am talking about you. If you are a, a bad BOS and you're not doing the work of helping small businesses, get out of the way because you are holding back the small business community. Get out of the way and let somebody else who do care about small business come in. If you want a comfortable government job, go find a different comfortable government job. And, and it doesn't hurt the small business community. 
But if you are a small business specialist, your number one job is to help small business succeed in the government market. And you haven't done your job. So the bad BOS, get out of the way. The good BOS, we celebrate you. Thank you for doing a great job in helping the small business community. So yes, Kai, I do have an opinion. I, I see. <laughs> I totally see. Um, so, so I, I generally agree with you. You know, I'm, I'm not shy in, in expressing my challenges with uh, the SBA and the process, right? But like, you know, getting back to the size standards, to me, the size standards isn't necessarily the problem, right? It's, it's, it's the whole kind of system. That is a try is a challenge. Well, it is now, the problem because it's used to skew the perspective. I, I don't agree. I, I disagree with you there. Right. We talked about in the past that the way if you look at the way the SBA measures their spending with um, with small businesses, they are reading, reaching the goals. Right. They 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 will show that they've they've done they have like across all these agencies. They have reached their goals. But when reality, we know that that is not the case. We know that that. These numbers, when when they there's double counting in the numbers, they they have different ways of looking at the data than what it is just purely just looking at number of contracts that are awarded to businesses of a certain size and of a certain uh, standard. So, you know, I, I in my opinion, um, you know, there's other there's plenty of other areas for the SBA to revise and figure out. Um, if, if for me, I would I would say the scorecard is the number one place where they should start, because the way that they are evaluating how how much money they're spending, these agencies are spending, you know, is is just not um, it's not fair, in my opinion. Um, in addition to that, you know, the way that they um, so yeah, look at this government wide performance. Hey. All right. So the SBA gives them a score of, hey, let's pat ourselves in the back. We got an A. You know, if I was in class, I, I would sure like to give myself an A too, right? But but let's look at this here. So if we look at the numbers here, and if we look at the overall numbers, um, where is the numbers down here? So they're saying that uh, I want to actually look at the total dollar amount, and I'm you know I'm you know I'm going to talk about that there. So. So small businesses, the overall goal is they said that they achieved 26% of their small business goal. And and then let's look at the over, over. the what? They did 106, 104, or what was the top number? 104% over. And um, yeah, 100, yeah, over. 4% over. They did, they, you know, they, they, they over. They went above, a little bit above their, their goal. Yeah, but if we look at it, right, if we look at the dollar amount and the dollar amount doesn't add up because they're saying that small businesses, um, their goal is not established on the total contracting dollar amount. Their goal is, is structured under uh, removing uh, probably about almost $200 billion of the contracting opportunities out there, and they don't include that in their calculation. So when you're manipulating the data and manipulating number and defining how you measure the goal, then I can I can change the numbers to make myself look good at any given time. But that's another topic. So uh, we, we, we've already discussed this, sir, and this kind of goes into what we looked at, you know, because we're coming to the end of 2023 and we can talk about the SBA and, you know, my love-hate relationship with them as much as we want to. But but let's talk about the year review because we did talk about this previously. Um, and we have done all these different episodes in, in here. here. All right, so in terms of our total uh video we've done 133 videos in the gov genie uh this week on contracting podcast we went from zero subscriber to 651 subscribers in the last you know seven eight months so thank you for being part of our community and we love doing this here uh we plan to do more videos but at this time i want to do a little bit of review of some of the things that we've done in this last year here so that we can just kind of do a little reflection and so I want to look at uh, this week in government contracting. We're going to look at the playlist here and just kind of go down memory lane a little bit of some of the things that we've talked about. And so if we go down to the episode one, and so this is our very first 
pilot webcast that we talked about minorities in government contracting and we started back in Juneteenth, right? When Juneteenth was, you know, came around, we said, hey, let's start this, let's start this webcast podcast here. And so that was the very first episode. You remember that the first time we did this here? I do, I do remember that. Seems so long ago now, but yes, I do remember. Yeah, and then we went to episode two, we went to episode three, and we talked about AI and how it's going to impact the government market. And you know, you know, GovGene is an AI uh, platform, and we're in, we're uh, adding more and more AI into the tool. So I'm looking forward to what GovGene will become as we get more AI into the GovGene platform as well. Uh, but you're an AI company, so what you know, how much have you seen in terms of AI have changed from? since we started doing a webcast or 2023 in terms of review itself, how far AI has come? Well, it's come a really long way. I mean, and it, it continues to, to go, go even further. I think next year will be very interesting to see what uh, AI is, <clears throat> is uh, you know, put into the market. And I think Google came out with their, um, you know, their upgraded AI product, uh, Gemini, like a couple weeks ago. And it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens. So a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities, you know, even in our space, and um, you know, there's gonna be uh, it's gonna be really interesting to see how we apply this to to the government space and how ultimately the American people will benefit from it. Yeah, I think AI has come a long way. Uh, you're using AI to help you write proposals right now, and I actually tried it last night for the first time using AI to help write proposal. Very interesting results. So I'm excited about playing around with more and and seeing how AI can help write proposals. Uh, one thing looking back also, one big thing that happened this year was the 8 program got challenged big time this year. And to to where all of you who were applying for the 8A, you know, uh, application, you know, you put in your application and it came to a screeching halt. So with this, ah, we can't process your 8A application. And then all of the businesses that were 8A certified, what happened to you, Kai? Yeah, we had a you know, create a uh, social disadvantage letter. So, <laughs> you were already yeah. in the 80 program. They said, hey, come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. You know, you got to submit another document to to stay in the 80 program. And so for many of you who are 80 certified, you have to submit your your social disadvantage narration. And they came up with a whole new process of how to do that. So that was a big, big thing that happened this year. Um, and then many other things happen and we update it to you. We show you guys how to do the disadvantage narration. If, you, if you're applying for 8A, if you don't have the 8A yet, reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to give you the 8A template, the 8A uh, social disadvantage narrative template. Reach out to us. Our content information is in the description area. And then we talked about, yeah, we spent, man, multiple episodes talking about the, uh, the 8A program. Uh, and then, ooh, remember this episode? With George? Yeah, yeah. We t we talked about George. Uh, that was a real good episode. That was a great episode. It was. Uh, hearing about his success was very inspiring and still inspires us. And uh, we, you know, I think that's one of the episodes that a lot of people have seen. Obviously, you know, the number of views there you see, uh, um, I think that might have been a, one of our most watched episodes. But, you know, everybody was kind of inspired by his success. And, um, you know, we aspire towards, uh, you know, create their own little version of that uh, in our own businesses. Yep. George shared about how he won. He spent three years of trying to win contract and he didn't win any contracts. And then finally he got procurement ready and, uh, you know, you know, started putting in the things that he learned and got some help, went to the government contract association, got some help from them and found a mentor and so forth. And his first contract was 51 million. His second contract was 75 million collectively 126 million, but we just kind of rounded it off for 125 million here. So that was a really interesting look, looking back in terms of what we did last year, uh, this, you know, 2023. And then some other things, you know, we actually talked about, we brought another guest to the episode and uh, Dr. Patricia, she won 22 contracts out of 60 proposals that she submitted. This is one of the highest win rate uh, in terms of a small businesses, because typically large company, large company wins about one out of three small business win one out of 22 proposal. Well, she won 22 proposal out of 60 
a proposal. So almost a almost like a 40% win rate, which is astronomically incredible. Totally agree. Totally agree. And she's uh, has so much to, to, to a lot of gems that she dropped on that episode and um, all excited about her. Her energy is, is uh, infectious, you know, love, love her energy. And, uh, you know, that, that was another inspiring episode. Hopefully we can bring more um, more stories like that to the podcast next year and, and even bring back uh, uh, Patricia and and, um, and, and George uh, to, to share, you know, an update and how they're doing. Absolutely. And then our last week's episode, we talked about inflation and how inflation, there is a there is a opportunity uh, for most of you. If you if you were on a firm fixed contract, FF, uh, FFP, and your pricing are locked, or if you have a GS- GSA schedule and your pricing are locked, Congress is giving you permission to go to your contracting officer and reallocate your pricing so that, you know, because inflation has gone up by 8%, 9%, 10%, depending on the market that you're in on average, but almost 10% every year. So if you're talking about the last three years, maybe between 20 to 30% in terms of inflation rate, but your pricing on your GSA schedule or your firm fixed price contract have been static. If you might be on five year contract on a one plus four option years, and your price have been locked in at 2% interest or 2% inflation adjustment, uh, or maybe three. On average, most GSA rates adjust about 2 to 3%. And now you're looking at about almost 30%. And so it impacted you. So go watch that previous episode, you know, as we talked about inflation and how to get some adjustment and relief for your company. But man, we cover a lot of things. Uh, 2024 is coming coming around, and we're going to be doing you know doing these episodes here. We've got guest speakers that's going to be coming to join us. Uh, so this week in government contracting is going to be so much so much more exciting for next year. So um, so any anything in terms of looking back for 2023, any final comments you have? Uh, you know what? I think you covered it all. But just excited that we started this podcast. We took the the, the leap of faith. And um, it's been successful so far. So I'm looking forward to another year of, of um, government contracting news and progress. And in addition to that, I'm looking forward to all the things that we're going to be bringing to the community uh, through GovGenie, um, our platform. So uh, be on the lookout for more information about all the things, all the new features that are coming to our platform. Um, our team is working hard uh, you know, to, to add more value to the platform and our, and our end users in hopes to help them you know, connect with each other, connect with the community, and ultimately win new contracts. And then last comment here, please like and subscribe. And w- one call out, if you are a small business owner and you want to be a guest on our podcast, reach out to us. We'd love to have you come, share your story, share your journey to our audience, and share you know, what you've done right, what you did wrong, lessons you've learned along the way, and so that you know, we can help the small business community get more government contract opportunities. And, and uh, we've seen that, you know, yes, you know, contracting goals are reportedly being met. The set aside goals are re- reportedly being met. I disagree with that. I think small businesses are not necessarily getting enough their fair share of contract opportunities. So if you're a business owner and you want to be a guest on our podcast, reach out to us. And we'd love to have you as a guest on our podcast. So until next year. We are taking the next two weeks off. Uh, we've got other episodes being released, but in terms of the full episodes, we're not doing any more full episodes until the new year is here. So uh, thanks for joining us for 2023, and we look forward to seeing you in 2024. Have a great one, and uh, happy new year. Happy holidays to all of you. Uh, see you next year. Take care, everybody.